So we're asking the question, how can I be sure that this Bible is the inerrant, infallible, inspired, authoritative Word of God? That is a question that I believe deserves a reasonable answer. I don't have all the answers, and nobody does, but I do have some answers. So what I'm trying to do with you is to provide for you seven reasons that you can easily remember on why you, not me, not your mama, not your daddy, not your grandmother, not your parents, but why do you trust this book called the Bible? All right, Psalm 12. Psalm 12 is where we're going to pick up here today. This is a psalm of King David. And listen to what he says. You can see it on the screen here. He says, Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. Everyone lies to his neighbor. Their flattering lips speak with deception. You know what flattering means. Flattering, the actual word there, is two-faced. It means you say one thing with your mouth, your lips, but you live another way with your life. He says, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips and every boastful tongue that says we will triumph with our tongues. We own our lips. Who is our master? Because of the oppression of the weak and the groaning of the needy, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. Now listen to what he says. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. In other words, unlike the words of men, unlike the deception of people, you can trust the word of the Lord. It is reliable. He goes on to say, O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. The wicked wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. Now look at verse 6 there that's highlighted. David says, The words of the Lord are flawless. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a heavy statement to make. The word of the Lord is really flawless, without error, without contradiction, flawless. It is like silver refined in a furnace of clay, and notice what he says, purified, tested, seven times. Seven, seven times. The word seven in the Hebrew Bible means perfected, complete. David is saying just as silver was put through the test of fire to make sure that it was legit, that it was accurate, so the Word of God has been tested. It has been tested over the centuries again and again, and it has been proven to be true and accurate. So, if you're just catching up with us today, as I know many of you are, last week we put the Word of God through some tests. We went outside of the Bible itself, and we took this book and we put it through the same test that you would put any historical document through, and we tested it. If you're catching up with us today, I hope you'll jot down these notes. First of all, we said that the Bible is true historically because it passes all of the tests that you would put any other historical document through. What are those tests? Remember what they were. Number one are eyewitness accounts. We know that the Bible is not some book written by some people hundreds of years later or thousands of years later who were not there when the events that they described happened. There were eyewitnesses there. 
Number two, remember this great big word, bibliographical test, right? Now, we know that we no longer have the original autographs. As far as we know, those original documents do not exist. But we have thousands of accurate copies of the writings of those original documents because of, remember, those tedious scribes that copied things with 100% accuracy down through the centuries. We also realized last week we have more copies of the original documents, copies of those copies, than any other historical document in history. That's powerful. L listen, listen to the genius of God in this. Because if I was God, I would, I would have just preserved, somehow preserved, the original document. Why not just, you know, make sure that somebody, whether it's a museum or some individual, preserved the original document? Why have all of these copies? Here's why. Because if we entrusted the one original autographs, the one original document to whatever it be, a museum, an organization, or a person, how do we know those original documents were not altered? But if you have a copy, and 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 we all have a copy, and all of those copies have not changed, and they've said the same thing, copy after copy after copy after copy, we can have a whole lot more confidence in that those scribes actually copied those documents to the T. Doesn't that make sense? That's the genius of God. So the Bible is historically accurate because it tests passes the test of this very complicated and technical test called the bibliographical test. We also said the Bible's true historically because it passes the archaeological test. Remember, we talked about archaeology is constant. Archaeologists are constantly digging up uh, places and, and artifacts and uh, sites that constantly confirm what Scripture has been saying all along. All right, so we know the Bible is true historically. Secondly, we know the Bible is accurate scientifically. Remember that. Science is always evolving, right? It's always updating. It's always changing. But what it's doing is constantly confirming what the Word of God has been saying all along. So, historically accurate, scientifically accurate. Now, those are discussions outside of the Word of God. What I want to do today, real quick, is I want to go inside the Word of God, and I want us to look at how we can trust the Bible because of what it says within the Bible. So thirdly, here's the new stuff today if you're taking notes. How do I know that this is the authoritative Word of God? I know it because it's not only historically accurate, not only scientifically accurate, it is prophetically accurate. Listen. What does that mean, prophetically accurate? It means that every prediction that God made through the prophets in the Bible came true. The Bible is filled with thousands of prophecies. And, and God said, this is going to happen at this time, in this place, at this particular time or in this particular person's life, and you know what? Every single time it came to pass. Over centuries and thousands of uh, years, I should say, these prophecies have already been fulfilled. In fact, there are a few that relate to end-time events that are still yet to be fulfilled. But thousands of biblical prophecies have already come to pass. Let me give you the example of the, the messianic prophecies. Just a real quick example here. 
There are over 400 prophecies written about the Messiah 500 years before he ever came to this earth. Those prophecies talked about where he would be born. They talked about how he would be betrayed. They even specifically said that he would be crucified between two criminals. That's pretty accurate. It even talks about the Messiah would die and he would rise again from the dead. Notice this. All 400 of them were fulfilled in only one man. And that is Jesus of Nazareth. Nobody else can make that claim except for Jesus of Nazareth. Somebody say amen. Now, I don't, have, I don't have the time to sit here and calculate all of the odds and show you those, but the odds of one man fulfilling all of these prophecies by chance are astronomical. In fact, if you're an atheist here today, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. But I want to tell you, it takes more faith to believe that this is nonsense than it, than it does to believe this is the Word of God. You can't just believe in coincidence. God made this stuff happen. <laughs> Second Peter 1, 16 through 21. Let's look at this. We read a little bit of this last week. I want to read it today from the New Living Translation. I want you to get an idea of what this scripture says. Peter is talking about when Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus was there. And all of a sudden, Jesus becomes very glorious uh, and Moses and Elijah actually appear now watch this Peter says we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ we saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father the voice from the majestic glory of God said to him this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy we ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. That's the Mount of Transfiguration. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. Now watch what he says. You must pay close attention to what they wrote. For their words are like a, sh a, a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. And Christ, the morning star, shines in your hearts. Above all, you must realize no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved upon by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Now, I mentioned this to you last week, but it's important to understand where the Scripture says they were moved upon or they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That, that word picture there in the Greek is actually of a, of a sailboat that sets its sails on the sea so that when the wind blows, it moves that sailboat across the top of the sea. That's the word picture that Peter is painting for us here. The writers of Scripture, it was not in their own mind and in their own thoughts to write it down on their own, by their own will, but it was when God, remember 2 Timothy 3.16, God breathed upon them. And as he breathed his word, as he breathed his, his thoughts, it came upon them and they began to write Scripture using their personality, using their perspective, using the language of the time. And so, God breathed upon these writers to record his words. And so they were all true. All prophecy of Scripture is true. And you can count on it because what God said in the past has come to pass. And what God has yet to say in the future is going to come to pass. So how can we trust the Bible? Because it's prophetically accurate. How do I know I can trust the Bible? Number four, it is thematically unified. What do I mean by that? I mean it carries the same theme through the entire 66 books. All 66 books are testifying 
and promoting this God's redemption story of his people through his son, Jesus Christ. I want you to write down some Bible facts real quick. The Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years during times of war, during times of peace. The Bible was written by 40 different people. This is important because they all had different backgrounds. Poets, prophets, prisoners, priests, sailors, soldiers, fishermen, shepherds, doctors, lawyers, tax collectors, and on and on the list goes. So, what does that mean? You, you would, you, like, like my history professor, you would have to question a book if it was written by one man. I mean, come on, let's take the Quran, written by the prophet Muhammad. Yeah, I would, I would uh, yeah, I'd have some questions about that. You, you would have to question this book if Joseph Smith, who literally, this is a fact, he was out in the woods one day and he claims that the angel Moroni appeared to him and said, write this down. And out of that came an entire religion called the Mormon religion with the Mormon Bible. I, I'd have to question that one. You would have to question this book if, like the Analects of Confucius, <laughs> they were written by a very confused man named Confucius. You would expect that those, that that, that 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 would be uniform. Yeah, you would expect that. But listen, the Bible was written by forty different people from every stage of life. You can't get a more diverse group than this. But what's funny is they all are saying the same thing. God was in the world reconciling the world to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible was written on three different continents. I don't know if you knew that or not. Some of the Bible was written in Asia. Some of it was written in Africa. Some of it was written in Europe. The Bible was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. All of these writers wrote on some of the most controversial subjects that today, if we were to sit down and have a conversation about these subjects, there would be no agreement. But all of these writers wrote on controversial subjects like death, hell, heaven, sin, future events, and on and on. And yet there's not one contradiction or disagreement between any of the authors. They are all in agreement telling God's redemptive story of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says. He's speaking to the Pharisees. And he says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. He was talking to a bunch of religious people who were, who were depending on knowing the Old Testament for their salvation. They thought because they knew the Hebrew Bible, they could depend on that for eternal life. And Jesus says, look guys, you don't understand. They are pointing to me. What scriptures was he talking about? The Old Testament. The Old Testament points to Jesus from Genesis to Malachi. And Luke 24, 27 says, Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all of the prophets, I love this, explaining from all of the scriptures things about himself. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there when Jesus was standing there going, wait a minute, guys, in Genesis, I am the seed of Abraham. In Exodus, I'm the Passover lamb. 
In Leviticus, I'm the great high priest. In Numbers, I'm the cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, I'm the prophet who's greater than Moses. In Joshua, I'm the scarlet thread out Rahab's window. In Judges, I'm the ruler and the judge. In Ruth, I'm the kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, Kings and Chronicles, I am the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In Ezra, I'm the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, I'm the rebuilder of broken walls. In Esther, I'm the one who intercedes. In Job, I'm the redeemer. In Psalm, I'm the good shepherd. In Proverbs, I'm the wisdom of God. In Ecclesiastes, I'm the creator to be remembered in the days of your youth. In Song of Solomon, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. In Isaiah, I'm the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Yes! Oh, wouldn't you have loved to have been there when he, he's, he's taking him through the Old Testament and he's saying, in Jeremiah, I'm the righteous branch. In Lamentations, I'm the one who gives mercies new every morning. In Ezekiel, I'm the wheel within a wheel. In Daniel, I'm the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, I'm the son that's called out of Egypt. In Joel, I'm the one who's going to pour my spirit out on all flesh. In Amos, I'm the restored tabernacle of David. In Obadiah, I am the Savior. In Jonah, I'm the one who spent three days and nights in the belly of a fish. In Micah, I'm the ruler called out of Bethlehem. In Naah, I'm the avenger of God's elect. In Zephaniah, he, uh, Jesus is the one who sings over us. In Haggai, Jesus tells the Pharisees, wait a minute, I'm the stronghold in the day of your trouble. In Zechariah, he is the coming Messiah. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Give him praise and glory today. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory to God. See, folks, from Genesis to Malachi, this story is about Jesus. All of the pictures, all of the analogies, all of the metaphors in the Old Testament, they are all about God's plan to redeem His people. And you can find Jesus in every book of the Bible. Oh, I love it. The Bible is thematically unified. How can I trust the Bible? I can trust it because... It was confirmed by Jesus. Yeah. Jesus confirmed the word. In Matthew 5, 18, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear. Remember this last week? Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus looks at the word and he says, look, this word is going to last until the end of time. It's going to accomplish everything that God has set out for it to accomplish. Jesus talked about the word. He talked about it as a real book. He talked about real people. He talked about real places, a real God who was really at work in people's lives. Let me give you a quick list of some people and places Jesus confirmed. Jesus believed in the prophets. That's what he said in the, in the Gospels. Jesus talked about Daniel as a real person. Jesus believed in Noah and the ark and the flood. Jesus believed in Adam and Eve. Jesus believed in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus believed in Jonah and the whale, and the whale swallowed Jonah literally three days and three nights. Folks, these are not fairy tales. These are not fables made up by men. Jesus said these were real events that really happened. And if Jesus confirmed the word, then who, and you and I, who are you and I to not confirm it? It is the word of God. The sixth reason you can trust the Bible, I love this one, it has survived all attacks. That's why I trust the Bible. It has survived all attacks. The Bible is the most despised book in history. It is the most denied, disputed, dissected book. It is the most debated book. It is the most outlawed book, destroyed book. It is the most banned book 
ever in history. Millions of people have given their lives and died because they would not give up their Bible. Listen, folks, this book can get you not only out of trouble, but it can certainly get you into trouble. If you were to try to take this book into North Korea today, you stand a chance of being killed. But the Bible has been under attack for century after century, but it is the most read book, the most published book, the most translated book in the world, the best-selling book in the world, and it is still making a difference in the lives of people. Yeah. Now, I love this. In 1778, this arrogant, cocky, French skeptic Voltaire said these words. 100 years from now, Christianity will be swept from existence and the Bible will be an outmoded and forgotten book only to be found in museums. Here's a fact. When 100 years were up, the Geneva Bible Society moved into Voltaire's house, used his own printing press to produce thousands of Bibles to distribute worldwide. That is a fact. <laughs> Let me give you another one. In 1885, Robert Ingersoll, holding up a Bible, said, In 15 years, I will have this book in the morgue. Here's a fact. Fifteen years later, Ingersoll was in a morgue, and the Bible still is marching on, friend. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will remain. Let me tell you something. This book will last forever. Everything else is going up in smoke, buddy, but you can hang on to the Word of God. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Somebody give God a praise for the Word. I'm not supposed to be preaching. Hallelujah. All right, as we're calming down, I'm, I'm supposed to be teaching. I'm, I'm supposed to be teaching. Okay. <sighs> Number seven. Here's why you can trust the Bible. Now, listen, we've been very objective about this, but I want to I give you, it's not objective, but I believe it is the most powerful reason we can trust the Bible. I can trust the Bible because it has transforming power. Nothing can change your life like the Word of God. When you read through the Bible from cover to cover, listen to me, you will find real people with real problems finding real answers from the Word of God. When Job was in despair, he cried out, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That's the desire that we ought to get. That's the hunger that we ought to have. God, I desire your word more than I desire to eat. David said in Psalm 19, 7 and 8, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, giving light to the eyes. Listen, over 3,000 people were listening to Peter preach on the day of Pentecost, and every one of them were convicted in their heart, and they cried out, what shall we do? And Jesus said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin and you will be saved. And that's exactly what they did. And the world was transformed because of the word of God. People I personally know. People in this room. People you personally know. Their lives have forever been changed by the word of God. Pimps, prostitutes, 
perverted people, drug addicts, alcoholics, religious people, non-religious people, good people, bad people, white people, black people, brown people, yellow people, rich people, poor people, old people, young people, people like myself who years ago I would have said, what are you talking about the Bible for? It has no value in my life. But today I will tell you, I can't live without this book. I need the Word of the living God. If there's anybody today that has been transformed by this book, stand to your feet and let's give God a shout of praise. You, hallelujah. The Word of God is true. Woo! Hallelujah. You can be seated. The fundamental question, folks, listen to me. The most important question you will ever have to deal with in your life is this one. Who or what is the final authority in my life? Now, I'm telling you right now, that's what we in America as believers are dealing with right now. What authority do we stand under? Whose opinion matters? Who or what will be the final authority in my life? Is it the world or is it the Word? Is it my opinion or is it what God has declared to be true? Because let me tell you something. If this book is not true, then we are all in trouble. Because my salvation and your salvation depends upon this book being 100% perfect, pure. Not one lie, not one contradiction. This book, my, my eternal existence, whether I go to heaven or hell, depends on this book being accurate and true. Because it is in this book that tells me that my life is not an accident. We're not an accident, folks. Listen, this book tells me in the beginning of beginnings, chapter 1 of Genesis, God created me in His image. In the image of God, He created them male and female. Don't change that. Whose authority do you believe? You're going to have to make up your mind as a believer, as a so-called Christian, somebody living in America where everything is relative. You're going to have to make up your mind who's your authority. This book tells me I'm not an accident. I'm created in the image of God and that God through his son Jesus Christ, I can have this wonderful Abba Father relationship with him. I can become his adopted son. You can become his adopted daughter. We can become sons and daughters of God through Jesus. This book tells me how to succeed in life. It tells me what to do, not if, but when I fail. What do I do? This book tells me how to have the peace of God in my life. This book tells me about how to escape hell and how to make heaven. The Bible is trash? I don't think so. This is the inspired, infallible, inerrant, authoritative word of God and I believe it God said it and it doesn't matter what you say it is the truth come on 
Come on, America. Come on. True. Listen, folks. If this present generation stands a chance, we have got to get back to the authority of this book. If America is ever going to be healed, we've got to get back to the authority of the Word of God. Hallelujah. God, we love your word. We love your word. It is truth. It is truth because you said it is truth. But we thank you today that we can have a reason for the hope that is in us. Seven reasons why we believe the word of God is inspired. You know what I'm going to do? I want to lead you in a confession today as Christians. Don't often do this, but I want us to do this today. I want us to pray this confession concerning the Word of God. And I'll lead you in it. I just, I just want you to repeat it. May, you know what? Just put your hand over your Bible or over your heart today. And would you say this like out loud, like, like, like if you were militant about it because <laughs> I yeah, yeah, and, and don't take that word the wrong way but I think you know th there's enough militant people outside these four walls that it's time we get a little militant inside the four walls so that when we walk out the out of the walls we can have a little bit of confidence to know what we believe so would you pray this prayer with me today say dear God from this day forward I will accept the Bible as your word to me, I will make it the final authority for my life. Not what television says, not what popularity says, not what culture says. I choose to make the word the final authority in my life. Even when I don't understand it, even when it's not popular, even when it's not easy and even when I don't like it you are God and I am not thank you God for loving me enough to speak to me thank you that you are not silent you sent your word and healed me you sent your son to save me teach me to love your word to learn your word, to live in your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Listen, whether you're here in the building today or you're watching online, if somewhere in your spirit today you made a commitment to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you may be a family member today coming to watch somebody be baptized or maybe you're watching online and one of your sons or daughters were baptized today and that spoke to you and it said my heart's not where it needs to be with God I've been playing games and I need to get right with God if you made a step of commitment to faith in Jesus today I want you to text the number on your screen new life new life to the number on your screen we want to connect with you in these crazy days that we're living in. That's the way we're following up on people is through a text. And so today, we hope that you'll do that. Make Jesus Lord of your life, and we want to make sure we connect with you. Now, next week, listen to me. We're going to talk about foundation. I'm so passionate about people getting hungry for the Word. I want to teach you next Sunday on how to build your life on the Word of God. It's one thing for me to stand up here and to tell you, trust the Bible. And to explain to you why you should trust the Bible. But now we're going to go a little step deeper 
and we're going to talk to you about how do you do that how do you build your life on a practical way how do you build your daily life on the Word of God if this book is going to be the authority over us then how do I walk that out in my daily life hey we hope you enjoyed the sermon today and before you leave would you subscribe to our page and check out our website new life exists to love God lead people and to live a better story we sure hope to see you soon